Hello everyone, Dr. Philip Travis. This lesson, this history lesson, we're going to examine the emergence of the United States as a world power, as an empire, an overseas empire, an overseas and international world power. And the particular moment that we examine historically for this turning point is the period between 1898 in 1902, uh, the period associated with the Spanish and Philippine-American Wars. If you're into history videos, uh, history topics such as this, um, please subscribe to my channel. If you're watching this through YouTube, you'll see the little subscribe link at the bottom corner of the screen. In this video, I want to talk not only about the actual historical sort of facts that uh, emerged in the United States' as emergence as a world power, but also the way that historians over time, the historiography, the way historians have dealt with this. So let's get right into this. Here you see a painting. Uh, this painting is by John Gast from 1872. Very, very famous depiction of of what some have referred to as the as is the title of the painting, Manifest Destiny, relating to the American expansion into, into the Western territories. Take a second and examine this painting and see if you can come up with any um, any themes, anything that comes out um, about this painting as you as you sort of observe and, 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 and take apart this painting. So take a second. Just look, what do you see here, and what does this tell you about American history? So first of all, of course, the things you see, you see the various um, elements of industrialization, the idea of progress, um, telegraph lines, industrialization. You see, of course, um, the symbolic, you know, angelic figure of, of American expansionism and liberty, if you will, carrying, of course, um, the Bible. You see settlers and, and, and the like moving west, uh, apparently controlling and taming the rugged west. And in the background, of course, in the dark areas of the background, you see the construction of the other. Native Americans, an untamed and barbaric, um, allegedly savage world that somehow the western colonial United States was going to um, improve, tame, and control, and conquer. This painting really, it opens the door to a huge historical conversation, and one that um, has, has, has really gone on for a long period of time, really since this painting was made among historians, and that is, is the United States inherently expansionist. For many, many um, years, historians used to regard um, the, the conquest of the American West, in many cases for historians, was almost written off as an afterthought. The other, the Native American peoples, their life, their culture, all these types of things, was to a large degree almost discounted by historians until the last several decades. Likewise, when it came to the United States becoming in empire, historians also, for a long period of time, historians like Frederick Merck, for example, argued that this was an aberration. This was called the aberration approach to understanding uh, American empire and expansionism. The idea being that the United States was somehow not inherently expansion. It was not imperial, but yet there was this moment between 1898 and the first decade of the 20th century, where this was this aberration moment where the United States became an imperial colonial power. Um, scholars like Frederick Merck argued that. Now, in the last four or five decades, scholars um, like William Appleman Williams or Walter Lefebvre or Andrew Stevenson, um, amongst many others, have actually resoundedly refuted that position, the aberration idea, and instead argued that uh, they, what would be more of a, a continual, um, a continuity theory, if you will, of history, that the United States is and was historically inherently expansionist. 
You could go back to the colonial era and look like colonial wars, like Bacon's Rebellion in the Chesapeake Colony in 1676, in which Nathaniel Bacon led an expansionist war against Native Americans that was effectively driven to more or less exterminate Native Americans in the western areas of the Chesapeake, uh, the area of Virginia today. King Philip's War in Massachusetts, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony at a similar time. Both of those opened the door to uh, almost continual um, expansionism in United States continental history. And of course, when we come to this 1872 painting by John Gast, the concept of Manifest Destiny, the, the idea that was held by many that there was some divine calling and right of the United States to expand, conquer, and control um, other peoples, particularly other uh, non-white peoples, indigenous peoples of the world, really became a, a, a widely accepted idea. And as, of course, this painting was, was, being, was being made, the United States was completing the conquest of the West. It was only a few uh, years after this that you will have the infamous Battle of Wounded Knee uh, in the so-called closing of the frontier as the conquest of the American West had occurred. Uh, of course, there were also the Mexican-American War that was fought, among other uh, conflicts, as the United States expanded into the American West. And then, of course, we come to the Spanish and Philippine-American Wars. And when we look at the Spanish and Philippine-American Wars, you're going to realize that the United States, in many cases, carries its Western continental expansion across the Pacific in building an overseas empire that connected territories from Hawaii to Guam to Wake Island to the Philippines across the Pacific, creating an empire in the Pacific. Um, in, in that sense, um, opening the door eventually for the collision of empires that would occur between the United States and Japan in the lead up to the Second World War. What forces drive decisions for war? Why do countries go to war? Why do countries choose the path of imperialism? When we look at history, there's kind of two ways to look at this. There's the external factor, the pull. And these, and there can be some overlap in these things, of course. The external, though, these is uh, motivations that uh, that drive a country to war, that drive a country to empire, that might involve national security interests. It might involve the pursuit of economic benefit. Um, it might it might be an example where the country is intervening for humanitarian purposes. All of these could be things outside of the United States that the United States or any country feels compelled that it must in intervene in a place. So an external pull. A humanitarian crisis might pull a country to intervene. The potential economic benefit from trade relations or resources might pull a country to intervene. A national security, uh, a national security concern where uh, the national interests of a country might be threatened if they're not intervened. These are external factors that might pull a country into war. There are also internal push factors, okay, that might, and these are almost always in conjunction, they almost always work together uh, in decisions for, for conflict, for, for involvement in war. The internal push factors, these are things within your society and your culture. These could be cultural factors. These could be things like, um, we'll talk about, what we're going to do here is we're going to apply some of these to the cases we're looking at here with the Spanish and Philippine American wars particularly. And we're going to see how these con these factors were motivated, m motivations involved in the United States ultimately uh, becoming involved in those conflicts. The popular will, the will of the people to desire, to, to, to demand sort of action on the part of the government, that could be a factor. Cultural factors, um, racial factors, we see in the examples we're going to look at the sort of drive, and you see this in the American West, the drive of the so-called racial civilizing mission, the idea that Americans believe that uh, white Western civilization was more advanced racially and had a right and even a calling in many cases, people would argue at this time, 
to conquer and control, if you will, savage populations. This is what they were termed. This is the white man's burden, as I'm sure many of you have heard from. There are also political ideals, right, that might uh, drive a country, push a country into war. Ideas of, uh, of gender as well can push a country into war. We're going to look at the Spanish-American War first, then we're going to look at the Philippine-American War. And we're going to kind of try to use this, if you will, a roadmap for understanding how and why a country goes to war uh, to try to understand these two conflicts and why and how the United States emerges as a world power, becomes an, uh, an empire, why it intervenes in these, con in these conflicts. And, and again, historians today strongly argue for continuity. American empire was not an aberration, but really a continual sort of um, expansionist trend of, of control, conquest, and imperialism that really began in colonial period and continued well through the 20th century. In the 1890s, by the 1890s, I should say, the stage was really set for the United States uh, to begin further expansion um, in its sort of global ambitions as a world power. It had completed its continental expansion. It was a massive industrial powerhouse, and markets, particularly markets in Asia, um, in China more than any, uh, were really viewed as essential to the nation's economic strength. As it increasingly began to produce so much that this production began to um, outpace the consuming capacity of the country itself, there were also there were also factors such as um, the Cuban Revolution and humanitarian factors that were very much on the mind of many Americans and political thinkers as well. The Cuban Revolution of 1895 resulted in the Spanish Empire really suppressing the Cuban uh, revolutionaries uh, with really tremendous force. They called in a general. They called him the Butcher. His name was General Weiler. And Weiler really pursued um, aggressive pacification policies um, on Cuba, uh, placing people into concentration camps and, and, and so on. Pacification is a, um, a word that really refers to colonial powers, uh, military efforts to destroy rebellions. And it generally means pacification, campaigns of pacification, generally mean that the country, the imperial overlord, if you will, will and can use whatever force necessary to completely eliminate and destroy um, any kind of guerrilla resistance. So we see this in Spain's domination of Cuba, and that caught the eyes of Americans. The Cuban Revolution of 1895 caught the eyes of, American, uh, of Americans that, 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 they, that the United States had to do something about uh, this Spanish injustice in Cuba. The United States also was beginning to develop its preparedness to be a world power, and that was motivated to a significant degree by the work of Alfred Thayer Mahan, who you see pictured here, who wrote The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. And the thesis of this work, more or less, was this idea that great powers had to have territories overseas, and in order to have territories overseas, you had to have a large, significant, and powerful navy so that you could maintain your national security and effectively advance your nation's international and national interests as a world power. And so... Thayer Mahan's influence of sea power upon history was really a really important work uh, when it came to framing the thinking of many policymakers moving into the 20th century. Even Chester Arthur, the president that many of you will remember, I hope, um, after the assassination of James Garfield, the president who was associated with the Pendleton Act, with beginning civil service reform following the, um, the result of of the patronage system and its cause of the assassination of President James Garfield, Chester Arthur actually, which is not usually remembered, began one of the first periods of the modernization of the American Navy. And in that sense, Chester Arthur began to, um, even though he never won election in his own right, Chester Arthur actually made an important step. 
in the development of the United States as a legitimate uh, naval power in the world, though uh, it took a number of decades before one could possibly say that the United States was really a naval, global naval power. The catalyst for the United States' intervention in the Cuban Revolution, in the, uh, in the beginning of what's called the Spanish-American War, came with, of course, the sinking of the USS Maine, which occurred in February 15, 1898. There were some 260 Americans um, that died as a result of this. This was a warship, as you see pictured here, and it was sent to Havana Harbor in Cuba, uh, effectively to send a message to the Spanish Empire. As the Spanish Empire brutally suppressed the Cuban revolt, um, the United States... Uh, there was increasing political pressure on the United States um, internally, and the United States government was preparing for action, and it sent this warship there uh, to kind of send a message to the Spanish uh, in Cuba, as well as to be there to, um, if needed need be, uh, protect Americans and American interests there. The ship explodes, and, and it's a devastating event. Um, now, we know that this... Uh, this was almost certainly caused by a boiler explosion. This was a, a steam-powered vessel, um, and steam power would build a great deal of pressure in a boiler, um, and sometimes when you had things fail, it could result in massive explosions. We know today um, that almost certainly this was um, a boiler explosion. At the time, though, there was a matter of debate. Some suggested it was a boiler explosion, while others intensely, intensely asserted that it was somehow the treachery of Spain, that this was a Spanish mine that had destroyed the ship. Uh, Spain denied this vigorously, and Spain was in no position or desire, really, to go to war with the United States. But there were very intense sort of uh, calls uh, for war against Spain, particularly following this event, and the accusations of Spanish treachery were powerful in the United States news media, as you see here. Now, yellow journalism, the yellow press, this is an idea, this is the role of the press exaggerating events or embellishing on affairs to sell papers, to, to, to get readers. Um, and, and many important uh, newspaper um, uh, leaders, I guess we should say, William Randolph Hearst, Joseph Pulitzer, uh, certainly were engaged in, at times in, in, in yellow journalism, this exaggeration of, of news media information. And, and certainly the exaggeration, yellow journalism's exaggeration of the sinking of the USS Maine was certainly a factor in building up people's desires to uh, go to war with with Spain. However, it's important to note that this has actually really been exaggerated in American history. And this goes along with the aberration idea of American empire, that somehow the United States had really no desire to, uh, to become an overseas power, that the United States was not on a path of expansionist imperialism, that this moment was an aberration and it was somehow uh, built up you know, by the work of yellow journalism, the yellow press as it was called, and, um, and that somehow this resulted in this frenzied moment where America became an empire and went to these wars and then retreated from it after having taken colonies like the Philippines and territories like Puerto Rico and Hawaii and so forth. That's really an overstatement. As we said, historians today um, are much more keen to assert a continuity idea of history uh, when it comes to the United States as an expansionist and imperial power. And in this sense, historians would suggest that, yes, yellow journalism played a role in this, but America as an expansionist power was much more sort of um, consistent in its path towards expansionism that um, this might have played a role in, 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 some, in some cases of the timing of events. But uh, American policymakers and the American people were on many, many levels um, you know, preparing to become an overseas power. That this was not an aberration, but was something more consistent. There was a greater continuity 
in American history. And so yellow journalism matters, but as a factor in the, in the actual cause of the war, probably overstated um, throughout much of the common understanding of 20th century American history. Cultural factors, and this will be the last slide on this part, and then I'll do a second part of this video. Cultural factors also sometimes justifies war imperialism. So uh, you think about some of the drives. So um, internal factors, right? So yellow journalism is an internal push, a reaction to an external event, right? Cultural factors, ideas of race, civilization, manliness, and gender, these are external, these are internal pushes, right? This is cultural drives for war. Here you see a, um, a famous work of American history by historian Kristen Hoganson, Fighting for American Manhood, How Gender Politics Provoked the Spanish and Philippine American Wars. This book is a book about how figures at the time who were highly significant in, 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 uh, in this moment, uh, like Theodore Roosevelt, who of course you you, many of you may know Theodore Roosevelt before becoming president, uh, joined as a volunteer rough rider in Cuba, fighting um, uh, in, 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 in conflicts like the so-called Battle of San Juan Hill and these types of things, as a volunteer fighter, a rough rider in, uh, in the Spanish-American War and the Cuban and the conflict on Cuba. Roosevelt, uh, an American statesman, future president, and very much... Uh, in favor of a strong global influence of the United States, Roosevelt and others were driven to engage in these conflicts largely out of, or at least in part, out of a drive to promote manliness. There was a belief held by many progressives that the United States, as it became an increasingly urban uh, country, uh, as it became an industrial country with more people living in cities than the countryside, that this somehow made people weak. And they believed that what made the United States strong was that it was white, it was Western European, there was an underlying race, or an overt, really, racist theory behind this, and that this somehow, this strength came when, when white Americans engaged in conflict on the frontier with rugged, savage barbarism. This is what they thought. And they thought as the United States had completed continental expansion and increasingly people, you know, you know, lived in cities and so forth, that it made people weak. And at the time, there was this construct that, um, that, 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 that manliness meant a certain type of thing. That to be a man meant that you were rugged, you were strong, you hunted, you fought, right? And that being a, you know, a, a, a person in, in, in business or college or something in uh, a city, uh, meant that you were you were weak, and that there was a fear at this time. That there was a crisis of manliness. That the country's um, young men were becoming weak. That is a cultural factor, a construct of what it means to be manly um, versus what it means to be feminine. And that construct of manliness was a motivating factor by many many imperialists at this time to go and make war with Spain, to relish in the killing of a Spaniard on the island of Cuba in the sense, in the thinking that this would somehow um, make young Americans more manly. And so that's another example of the internal push. Remember those factors, external drives, right? Trade, markets, Asia, right? Navies to maintain your economic and national security interests abroad. Internal factors, how things are presented to you in the media, your uh, cultural drives surrounding things like race and gender and these types of things. These are cultural factors, internal pushes. So we can see how this conflict is sort of, uh, you have a combination of the internal and the external drive as the United States becomes really an overseas empire. Over here, of course, you see, over here you see, of course, um, the route that the United States armed forces led by General um, Shafter uh, took his, his armed forces in ultimately blockading and attacking Cuba. Puerto Rico is over here, which uh, is a little bit cut off of this map. Puerto Rico is also seized in this war. The conflict is really, it's over in a matter of months. It's a conflict where very few Americans died from fighting. Maybe roughly 400 died from fighting. Uh, 
whereas some 5,000 died from exposure to disease and, uh, and environmental conditions and so forth. The American Armed, For Armed Forces at this time was was a, a, an unimpressive, an unimpressive force. Um, Shafter was terribly out of shape. The Army was, uh, and the Navy was, you know, only only really half trained, half not trained, if you will. Um, but the Spanish were an empire facing demise. And uh, in many cases, the Spanish, and when we look at the other conflicts, in, in many places like in Guam, for example, when the American armed forces went there, um, the Spanish uh, didn't even have ammunition to, to return fire in certain cases. And so Spain was really not prepared were able to carry out much of a fight here, and the conflict um, ultimately um, uh, is, is a very short conflict. The United States seizes power uh, from the Spanish, but it doesn't colonize Cuba. It had faced a great deal of pressure from the international world uh, who were suggesting that the United States was becoming a colonial power. So what the United States did is in two so-called amendments, the Platt Amendment and the Teller Amendment, the United States with Cuba would help to rewrite the Cuban Constitution so as to, on the one hand, assert that the United States was not colonizing Cuba, but then on the other hand, to effectively assert that the United States had a right to militarily intervene in Cuban internal affairs when it saw necessary to maintain what it would say would be something in the way of stable political law and order. Uh, but in real reality, this was about maintaining American interests in the place. The United States was also able to lease, um, to maintain as territories effectively, uh, or to take as territories effectively, certain installations, certain areas in Cuba, like the Guantanamo Bay facility.